I'm here tonight to suggest very, very strongly that many of the illnesses that afflict us today in ever-growing numbers and severity were hatched in biological warfare laboratories and have now escaped, whether intentionally or accidentally, and are now among us today. Welcome to Working TV. I'm Libby Davies. If you believed that aircraft with secret government approval have been spraying noxious chemicals developed in U.S. military biological warfare laboratories on unsuspecting Canadians, would you be paranoid? Or if you yourself saw distinct plumes of chemtrails from this spraying, yet were told by Transport Canada that no such spraying was taking place, would you be delusional? You'd be absolutely correct, according to William Thomas, who has spent the last 14 months studying the chemtrails phenomenon. He's an award-winning journalist who recently wrote a book about the Gulf War Syndrome. This is the strange cluster of illnesses all linked to a deterioration of the autoimmune system suffered by troops who received anthrax immunization before being deployed in the Gulf War. It's a lot like the chemtrail syndrome. Perhaps Thomas is a fraud. Perhaps his photographs and videotape evidence are all fakes. We don't know for sure, and the mainstream media won't touch his story. Nevertheless, we're told that Project Censored USA, a respected media watchdog group, recently judged chemtrails to be one of the most underreported stories of the past year. So you be the judge. Here now is William Thomas on chemtrails. My story really began on the battlefields of Kuwait just after the Gulf War, just after liberation, when I entered that town and joined up with two other gentlemen in a Gulf environmental emergency response team. And the three of us were the sole response to the biggest environmental disaster of modern times, including an oil slick 25 times bigger than uh, Exxon Valdez, a slick that was later doubled in size by the oil rain falling out of that sky. We didn't see the sun our entire time in Kuwait. I was focused on the environmental aspects of that war, but when I came home from that conflict, I was very ill for a year. I had no functioning immune system. I would get the flu and it would linger for months and months and then return. And through a program of Superb vitamin supplementation, Dr. Masson here in this town. I was able to regain my health and my immune system. And when I heard from hundreds and hundreds of veterans about a strange illness they were calling Gulf War Syndrome, I became very concerned as a journalist that, again, this was not being covered by the mainstream press. And in 12 months of going every news source from Rolling Stone and Mother Jones to the New York Times, I was turned down everywhere because the story was simply too hot. That story on Gulf War illness was eventually published by Monday Magazine in Victoria, and I went on to write a book called Bringing the War Home. And in that book, I was able to show a photograph of a very tiny critter about the tenth of the size of bacteria called a mycoplasma, which Dr. Garth Nicholson and his wife Nancy, foremost microbiologists with reputations uh, highly regarded throughout the world in their profession, had tracked uh, Gulf War illness to this mycoplasma in the anthrax vaccines given to Canadian, American, Australian, and British soldiers. Many of them got sick even though they never deployed to the Gulf. And I concluded the book by saying, the only good news is, with some 200,000 sick veterans in North America and their spouses and their children, at least the mycoplasma and these biological weapons are not loose among the public. I was wrong. So tonight we're going to have a look at what is really ailing us. We're going to have a look at what is happening in the skies overhead, and we're going to talk about what we can do about that.
In January 1999, I got a phone call from the managing editor at the Environment News Service, whom I worked for in the Gulf, and he said, please check out a story of a man named William Wallace, just over the border in Washington State, who lives in eastern Washington, a very remote region. He lives in a cabin with his wife. And Mr. Wallace has been talking about large airplanes overflying his house back and forth, spraying plumes that look like contrails. The condensation trails we're all used to seeing. But unlike these ice crystal trails that form in the hot engines of jet aircraft above 33,000 feet, according to the U.S. military and Canadian aviation authorities, unlike these condensation trails that linger usually, not always, but almost always, for about 30 to 45 seconds, you see the pencil-thin trail a short distance behind the aircraft, disappearing like the wake behind a boat. Unlike these trails, the trails that William Wallace and his wife Ann were seeing were broad, white plumes. They lingered for hours. And as these aircraft began crisscrossing each other and forming a grid, these plumes gathered together and took a clear blue sky and made it opaque, hazy, milky. Temperatures dropped. His animals sickened, his dogs died, his plants sickened, his wife became very ill. And when I went on Art Bell for the first time and used William Wallace's name with his permission, he was again visited for the third time by aircraft who sprayed their property. In fact, that night when I finished my first Art Bell show, I was living in a small cabin uh, in the hills outside of Chimanus. And I came outside about 3.30 in the morning, very wired from this very intense presentation. Took a breath of air, beautiful night, stars. Just started to relax and I froze. Giant X right over the cabin. Now I'm not paranoid or anything. <laughs> but when they started flying parallel patterns down the ridge right across from me, over the next few weeks, I began to wonder. I began to wonder if maybe some people were sensitive about having this story exposed. Let's have a quick look at what we're talking about because pictures are always better than words. I don't know about you, but people continually tell me, oh, these are normal contrails, these are normal <laughs> aircraft patterns. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if a commercial airliner, airline pilot pulled this stunt, they would lose their license. Yeah. These pictures were taken very recently over Nevada. Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and International Flight Center, and towards the end, Vancouver on Monday of this week. Legal spacing for commercial airliners is three miles. I believe the X's are for satellite identification. Don't worry, it's just normal airline traffic. <laughs> and if you wait a few minutes, you'll watch and see these chemtrails start to spread out as they're doing here. And if you have ignored the phenomena for an hour and happen to look up, you'll probably think it's just clouds. But fog forms at ground level. It doesn't form at 20,000 feet. But something else was going on, something else down here on the ground. Last winter in this city, in Victoria, in London, Ontario, in Toronto, Edmonton, cities across Canada, we saw an epidemic of influenza-like illnesses. That epidemic was also right across the United States and England. At Peterborough, the emergency room took 307 acute care patients in one day. In England, refrigerator trucks were hired to haul the dead bodies away. This is from the BBC, by the way. This is an exact repeat of the previous winter when refrigerator trucks were pushed into service at morgues in England. And we had 12 straight weeks of what the Centers for Disease Control called an epidemic of influenza-like illness and pneumonia, an epidemic in terms of death rates. England saw 8,200 people die in three weeks, mostly the elderly. This year, we looked at 19 of 20 weeks, epidemic levels, influenza-like illness, double pneumonia, and death.
death. The CBC called it the flu. Most of the media we received called it the flu. I'm here tonight to tell you it was not the flu. In fact, many doctors were echoing the words of one nurse supervisor who said, I don't think anyone knows what's causing this sickness. Doctors were saying this to the New York Times. And unlike flu that takes time to spread through a population, these illnesses were appearing virtually overnight in neighborhoods, communities, and cities, swamping hospital wards. And what the media never remarked on was that the incident of heavy spraying, the characteristic excess, the gel falling on parked cars and windshields and buildings, took place always at the same time. And within 24 to 48 hours, we saw these outbreaks of illness. Yes, some of it was the flu, but very little of it was influenza. The medical director for the Via Christi Regional Medical Center said, he told reporters, this thing kills even healthy people in four to five days. And I have a stack of emails of aunts and uncles and family members who suddenly contracted pneumonia, although in good health, and were dead within a week. But when the WHO and the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance Lab tested more than 18,000 people since last October, they found that 13% tested positive for influenza national average during an epidemic. In some areas, the peak, they tested 33% positive. Again, the national average was down around 13%. Reporters asked the CDC, what is this? And they said, this illness could be due to some other pathogen. And when I looked at the heavy spray days by city, I again got an exact correlation. No, I do not have scientific proof, scientific evidence, but folks were way beyond coincidence here. I'm Noam Chomsky. You're watching Working TV. And as I follow leads from Mr. Wallace who started contacting people across the United States. I ran into meningitis outbreaks in the wake of this strain. This is, has been a rare inflammation of the brain and spinal cord and comes on with flu-like symptoms, a skin rash, a stiff neck, severe headaches. And you know we're still running into those symptoms after heavy spray days in schools and communities across North America. In Bell River, just outside of Windsor, there were three cases and one death among 3,000 people, and they vaccinated everyone. Multiple sclerosis started showing up. Chronic fatigue um, has been a major component linked to the sprain, as well as lupus outbreaks in Oklahoma, Kansas City, Florida, other locations in the wake of heavy spraying. And then this came up, transverse myelitis, something so rare we rarely see it, <laughs> and yet at the Cedars sinai Hospital in LA, eight cases in two weeks after heavy spraying there hit people, pets, goats, other animals. So what do we have here? Well, we have a worsening epidemic over the past two years of a flu-like illness that has not been identified. A flu that is not the flu. We have, according to the CDC, an epidemic of deaths from influenza-like illness, pneumonia, and cardiac arrest. Now, since when is cardiac arrest a symptom of the flu? But that's what the CDC is reporting. And I've been a reporter and a columnist dealing with alternative health issues for years. And I have 
wondered at the sudden upsurge and predominance of autoimmune type diseases. We just mentioned a few, chronic fatigue, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. Virtually overnight in the past few decades, yes, our immune systems are under increasing attack, but I believe we are under other attack as well. I got back in touch with Dr. Garth Nicholson, and he said, he told me that now he believes that if we look behind chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus, in many cases, we are going to find mycoplasma, because that's exactly what he is finding, and he's also finding brucellosis. Well, as Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again, because this took me right back to my research for bringing the war home and my research into biological warfare and Gulf War illness, and I'm here tonight to suggest very, very strongly that many of the illnesses that afflict us today in ever-growing numbers and severity were hatched in biological warfare laboratories and have now escaped, whether intentionally or accidentally, and are now among us today. I'll have some good news in a while, I promise, but let's follow this line of inquiry. Brucellosis developed as an aerosol during World War II at Fort Detrick, premier bio-warfare lab on this planet. I talked to Don Scott, the author of the Brucellosis Triangle, and he, he has discovered that they were able to extract the active agent from brucellosis, discard the rest of the bacteria, so that when people got sick from this, doctors went in and they couldn't find the bacteria. This is genetic engineering at its most diabolical. This brucellosis was put in burster bombs and exploded over North Korea during the Korean War, and a plague did break out. Read the higher, a higher form of killing, if you can find that book, and it documents what happened. But then look at this. Soldiers at that time who were working in chemical biological warfare were given disability compensation if they contracted a certain disease within two years of discharge. What was that disease? Multiple sclerosis. John Scott says that he believes chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, are brucellosis derived. I noted in Bringing the War Home that from 1985 to 89, Brucellosis was among the shipment of germ warfare cultures shipped from the American Type Culture Corporation in Maryland, near Fort Detrick, to someone named Saddam Hussein. And in fact, it was the United States who armed Saddam Hussein with the chemical and biological weapons that he turned against their own sons and daughters after slaughtering tens of thousands of Iraqi soldiers on the battlefield. Now, mycoplasma has been a longtime favorite of the bioweaponeers. Like brucellosis, it's a stealth weapon. That is, there's no inflammatory antibody response that a doctor can recognize once it's been genetically engineered. They've been playing with this since the 1970s when U.S. Marines and Air Force personnel were tested uh, with mycoplasma. And guess what? Many of them contracted chronic fatigue and multiple sclerosis. Just around that time, 42 inmates the Huntsville prison died after experiments with an aerosol air delivered mycoplasma and brucellosis were given to them along with a few dollars. But what the experimenters didn't expect was that 231 nearby residents in that town would be stricken with chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, lupus, cancer, meningitis, and Epstein-Barr after that experiment. The Iraqis were also very interested in the mycoplasma. So we have a new breed of stealth viruses among us, thanks to the military genetic engineers. Dr. Martin at the Center for Complex Infectious Diseases has found in a chronic fatigue patient a brand new life form he calls a viteria, part virus, part bacteria, part fungus. It seems to be able to change from one to the other. Symptoms are severe headaches and joint pain. So we 
have chemical spraying. We have widespread illness that has not been identified by doctors or hospitals. We have a lot of questions, and we have a few answers here. And I'll say right now that we appear to have two programs at work. We have the high-level spraying that we just saw the slides that we've seen over this city as recently as today. And also we have something else going on, a low-level spraying involving helicopters and, more often, C-130 Hercules-type aircraft. And last summer I was in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, up in the mountains, a little resort community. I've just given some presentations across the southern and western United States. I was trying to relax, and I was walking across the main street in Pagosa Springs, and I just stood shocked as I saw a C-130 glide down over the town, throttled back, silent, right over this town, the spray, and then up and away. Well, this low-level spraying gave us our first breakthroughs in this case. And I'd like to show you just two more slides very quickly. Very lucky to have this. And these slides illustrate the brown gel that has been dropped in communities here in Canada, the United States, and England. This sample came from the central United States, November 1999. Sorry, yes, November 1999. And we were able to match it with a very similar sample sprayed a year previously from a low-flying aircraft in Pennsylvania. And eyewitnesses at the time thought the aircraft would hit the roof of the house it was spraying. And they had noticed tic-tac-toe and what they called weird designs in the sky. This is just one section of a garage that's aluminum siding there that was splattered top and bottom and sides with this brown gel material. It was almost impossible to get this off even with pressure washer. This stuff is very, very tenacious. We think it's a polymer coating. The first incidents that received widespread publicity of the brown gel was, of course, Oakville, Washington in August 1994. This is a little town, 665 people, about 80 miles southwest of Seattle. And that month, that town was covered during a rainstorm with brown gel, and virtually every person in that town became very ill with what residents told me was a really hard flu that lasted from seven weeks to two or three months. Cats died. People became dizzy, fell down, were hospitalized. And the state health department stepped in and analyzed this material, and they found that this goo was alive. They found human white blood cells. They found a pseudomonas fluorescens, which will give you very, very severe upper respiratory problems. And they found an enterobacter bacteria as well, and that was confirmed by a second lab. What they didn't find out is where it came from and why the aircraft were dropping it on this population. But we do have pattern and precedent here. We have some 50 years of biological experimentation on the people of this country and the United States and England, testing various biological warfare stimulants that, don't worry, won't hurt anyone, but in fact did hurt a lot of people who were susceptible. From San Francisco to New York City, Winnipeg in particular, some 2 million people exposed in England. They used ships and they used spray-equipped aircraft to deliver serratium arsescens, zinc cadmium sulfate, a known carcinogen by the way, and other material that would show up very quickly in their tests to test dispersal rates and infection rates in the population. And the idea was if you made people sick enough to report to their doctor or the hospital, you could track the efficiency of these weapons on your own population. Oh, this is legal, by the way, at least in the United States. Section 1520 says it's okay for the Department of Defense to test chemical and biological weapons on the population as long as it's for research purposes. But in November of 1987, that law was amended and now reads 30 days 
advance notice must be given to Congress, and any human subject subjected to these tests must be notified in advance. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't received any notification by phone or mail that I'm about to be and have been experimented on. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. As always, please help keep this show on air by letting your cable company know you're watching. Or better yet, tell them what you think of the show. They transcribe every one of your calls and pass them on to us. We'd love to hear what you think about chemtrails. Next week, we'll hear more from William Thomas on chemtrails, including his notion as to why they exist. See you next week. Goodbye for now. I'll stay categorically as a researcher and a person who's writing about health for many years that if we look behind the illnesses afflicting us now that are putting people in hospital, this flu-like illness, we are going to find fungus among us. Okay, treatment. We want to be alkaline. Fungal infections further acidic acidify our blood with their byproducts. If our bloodstream is alkaline, if we eat that green leafy stuff and avoid the fun foods, my primary supplement is cayenne. Cayenne. Heat up your blood. Cayenne and ginger and garlic and miso and shiitake, but cayenne. And also oxygenate your blood with li liquid oxygen supplements or Exercise, very important. We can knock out these, these fungal infections. Are those deaths that have been so often linked to this spray intentional? Are they really trying to do us in? Or are they an unfortunate and unintentional byproduct of a program that is seen to have overriding national security implications in terms of global warming? Or are the people behind this program getting two for the price of one? Never stop to wonder when watching my TV Why we who do the work so seldom see Now I'm wondering why we're blacked out or portrayed as troublemakers Or always in the background when on screen Work and TV Now we're on screen Work and TV Welcome to Working TV. I'm Libby Davies. This week, we continue with week two of the presentation on chemtrails by journalist William Thomas. According to Thomas, these chemtrails are the bizarre cloud-like trails left from the systematic spraying of chemicals over our cities and towns. Chemtrails look much like the contrails left by jet aircraft, but they don't dissipate in less than a minute as contrails do. In fact, they hang about for some time slowly dissipating and are often sprayed in crisscross or X patterns. Many of you claim to have seen, photographed or videotaped these chemtrails, yet Transport Canada and the mainstream media won't even acknowledge they exist. That's because according to Thomas, they are part of some kind of sinister plot to both control the weather and to cull our populations. This may sound like yet another nutty conspiracy theory. We're not so sure. At least we think Thomas deserves a listen. You decide. Here now, continued from last week, is part two of Chemtrails. Now I've been an environmental journalist for some 10 years. I attend conferences, I talk to scientists, and I keep up to speed on what is happening to this planet. I talk to advisors to this government, scientific advisors, and they are unanimous in calling what is happening to our atmosphere a global emergency. Ladies and gentlemen, this is...